Columbia Central School District. Before I make any formal introductions, I would really want to take this opportunity and thank the parents and members of our community first and foremost, who played already such an active role um, to engage with our school district administration to ensure that tonight we would be able to partake in such an important matter, which is school safety, not only for our district, but also in our county, in the state of New York, and for our entire country, where we are facing many tragedies and really has become the, one of the priorities and topics of conversation in education. Your questions, I went through them, we went through them. They're extremely insightful and they talk about things that what are we doing now and what are we doing for long-term plans as well in the Wabinger Central School District. I'd like to say that support and communication are two very important things and two very important factors that really have an impact to promote and increase school safety. It really goes to say, speaking of support, it starts with our Board of Education and as you can see, sitting in the front row, we have our president of the Board of Education, Mr. John Lumia, as well as our vice president, Mr. Keith Odoms, and our Board of Education members, uh, Marie Johnson and Ms. Peggy Kellen. So not only are they physically here, but they are always looking to see how they can continue to support the administration so that we can continue to promote and increase security for our schools and for our staff and students. In addition to that, I'd like to just take a quick moment to thank all of our senior staff administration and our, um, we have our president of our teachers union. And it's important to just indicate this. This is not about formal introductions and making this about people, but it just shows the support and the active participation that we have to this very important matter. It goes without say, you might have seen over and over again, our assistant superintendent, Darren Lokeem, is named with many of the emails, the surveys that went out. He has been extremely diligent, not only because of his position, but because of his real concern and making sure that we really do what's important for all of our students. Once again, as I said, this is not meant to be a speech. So I wanna get started right away with this conversation. And I wanna to introduce to you our Assistant Superintendent, Mr. Darren Lokima, who will then take the time, who will then share and introduce all of the members that are sitting in our panel today. But um, from the Board of Education and from the Senior Staff Administration, I really like to thank everyone who's sitting here on the panel and I know the work that you do and the active role that you play in your schools as well as within the community for the safety of our students and um, the Board of Education and the administration and the entire Wappinger Central School District community cannot thank you enough. So with no further ado, our Assistant Superintendent, Mr. Darren Lokima, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Carrion. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, just a quick, everyone's going to have a chance to introduce themselves, so I'll just do a quick intro about myself. Uh, my name is Darren Lokima, Assistant Superintendent for Compliance and Information Systems. I'm also the district's designated uh, Chief Emergency Officer, which is a required title by the state of New York when it comes to district safety. Uh, and I'm a community member. I've been in the district, uh, working in the district for 10 years, but I'm also a graduate, class of 1994, John Jay High School. Uh, I have two children in the district. Uh, my, my interests and my, and my uh, you know, vested, all my energies are focused uh, uh, on this community in the same way uh, that yours are. So I really appreciate everyone being here. Uh, you know, I, I love Wappingers and I love uh, coming to work to every day and, 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 and working with a great team of people uh, and, and talking about student safety and academics and all the wonderful things that we do here. So I do want to explain how the evening's going to go. Uh, before I let, uh, before I do the introductions across the uh, the panel, I want to explain a couple of the handouts really quickly. Um, the first one, uh, one is titled, I know you have different colored paper. I believe it's on a yellow sheet of paper. You have the Parent Guide to Emergency Response. Uh, we put this together just as a way for everyone to have sort of a common set of terminology, some brief overview of, of terminology, especially in the back when we talk about lockdown, evacuation, reunification and such, just to give you an overview de uh, 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 definition of what these terms really mean. And some of our panelists may refer to the document. 
uh, throughout the evening. Uh, we also have another document, I believe is on your blue paper, called the Legislative Advocacy Flyer. We're gonna talk more about this uh, as well, but this is, this is an important thing that you guys can help us with and we can work on as a community, uh, and, and we're gonna use this to address a series of questions on, uh, on the list of questions. I, we also provided you with the list of questions. This question, these questions were gleaned from the survey that happened in December, uh, where we sent everything sent out to the community. Uh, this is an evening event we wanted to do, the superintendent's idea, it was, and he said, this is something I really want to do. Can you please put it together? Uh, and so we took a survey. We got you know, over 70 questions in return. We collated them down, because some of them repeated as best as we could into a format that, uh, or into, and then put them in a ser an order of hopefully uh, a way that kind of makes sense and grouped them together. Some of them, they're not necessarily meant to be in a numeric order, because if you looked at question 31, for example, they're grouped together, like there's a bunch of 31. So we're going to try and answer them in bulk, like it, you know, they're similar type questions, so we're going to answer them at all at the same time, that kind of a thing. Some of the questions have some shading on it. The shading, uh, there, there are some portions of the answers that we will give that are from the perspective of a school safety plan. Now some of our, our school safety plans are considered confidential, they're procedures and protocols that are meant to be internal and internally discussed. Uh, and some, so some of the answers we won't go into too much depth because really what we would end up talking about is our procedures and protocols for dealing with emergency situations. So uh, the, the state of New York recognizes that the, the building safety plan protocols themselves are technically a confidential type of a, uh, 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 type of a uh, concept. Uh, and that's, that's, generally, that's generally it. So I think what's gonna happen is, is I'm hoping that you guys are gonna walk away with this with some great information um, if you need to have any fun, this is not an open mic type of night. We got the questions in advance so that way we could best prepare a panel of professionals who could best answer your questions. Uh, but we do offer on the question sheet my email address. If you have follow-up questions or if uh, you need additional questions asked, uh, please don't hesitate to email me and uh, we'll be sure to get an answer back to you as soon as possible. This uh, session is being recorded so it will be available on our website uh, tomorrow or the day after. And I think that kind of covers all the housekeeping rules. I think I'm supposed to say we've got exits on both sides and in the rear of the auditorium there's restrooms out to the left and in the event of a water landing your seat cushion will be used as a flotation device. So, all right, so going down the list, we have Mr. Paul Albanese, assistant principal at John Jay High School. Uh, Ms. Elizabeth uh, Rizzi, she is our school psychologist at John Jay. Mr. David Kazalawa, our high school principal at John Jay. Uh, we'd like to thank David Seip, Mr. our principal here at Royce Ketchum for letting us use his beautiful auditorium, but unfortunately he is sick uh, with the flu and uh, he cannot be with us this evening. Uh, next to Mr. Kazalawa, we have Dr. Shukat, principal at Van Wyck Junior High, Dr. Ter uh, Mr. Terrence Thompson, uh, principal at Wapner's Junior High School, uh, Mrs. Lauren Hernandez, principal at Evans Elementary, uh, Mrs. Amy Fazio, principal at Fishkill Plains Elementary, I'll be sitting in the empty chair next to her, and then the empty chair next to me will be for Assemblyman Kieran Lawler. He will be here about 6.30. Um, he's racing down from Albany uh, and is looking forward to being here with us, so he will be here. Uh, we have Mr. John Lapaka. He is the, 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 um, the CEO of Alteris Consulting Group. Next to him, we have uh, Officer Eric Vaughn from East Fishkill Police Department, Trooper Wilson from the New York State Police, and Deputy Alonzo Montaya from the uh, Dutchess County Sheriff's Department. So really, just really appreciate this panel. It's a great panel. A lot of great information is going to be shared. And I'm going to turn the microphone over to Dr. Amy Watkins, who's going to help moderate the questions and uh, keep us to a strict timetable on some of the responses. So our, our answers will hopefully be succinct and uh, informative. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lokima. Okay, so let's begin with uh, Mr. John Lapaka from Altiris, and he will be answering how secure are the schools in the Wappinger Central School District. Are you okay? Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the district for having me here this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to serve on the panel. As you might imagine, our firm, which works with probably about 35 to 40 school districts in the Hudson Valley and Long Island region, we do get asked to sit on panels quite often, uh, and it's always a great dialogue and a great opportunity to share all the things that the district is doing uh, to promote safety and security. I think when we talk about safe schools, the first thing we need to do is to actually put in context 
what what safe schools look like. When you look at um, statistically, uh, schools tend to be the research. All the research out there supports the fact that schools are actually very very safe environments. In fact, even more so than commercial environments. Um, unfortunately, the heinous crimes are the likes of the Sandy Hooks and the Parklands, uh, which are statistically very, very rare events, tend to dominate the conversation and serve as a catalyst for schools to then relook at what we're doing, what we're doing correctly, what we need to improve upon, excuse me, and, and look closely at it. Um, one of the things, the first thing that we did when we came into the district we brought in was to to look at the district to do uh, conduct an assessment to determine what are the things that the district is doing correctly and there were many and where are the improvement opportunities and kudos to the district for actually because it's very very difficult for a district to take a critical look in the mirror to say how are we doing uh, and that's a very difficult thing to do and, and they did it with open arms when we came in and worked with the teams at each of the buildings they were very very candid and open with us sharing all the information and we did we identified a number of improvement opportunities but more importantly we reinforced all of the things that the school is doing correctly that's a very you know difficult thing to understand what what in fact are we doing the right thing and unfortunately our work with many school districts across the region and across this state as well as other states is we have the collective knowledge to determine what are the best practices what is working well and how can those schools implement and improve upon those things so you know, right now, the district has a number of different measures that are in place. And I will say that when we talk about statistics, and I mentioned before, and being a parent of three school-age children right now, we talk about statistically being safe and statistically being rare. Unfortunately, any statistic, and I'm sure you'd all agree, any statistic is one too many when you're a parent. Um, because again, if there's any opportunity whatsoever of there being some type of threat to the safety and security of your children, then that is why the district does all the things that they do to prepare for. The mission really here is to prevent whenever possible and when necessary to respond effectively to any incident that the district may have to respond to. And they're much more likely to, to have to respond to a host of other incidents in their buildings than the worst of the worst. Uh, but there are a number of measures that are in place on here to make the school safe. Uh, it, there's no one thing that makes a school safer. It's a layered approach. It starts with prevention. Uh, we look again at the research. Unfortunately, all, for all the things we do to keep people out of our school buildings, uh, the majority of incidents, when we talk about some of the severe ones and the critical ones, the majority of them occur uh, and conduct by people that are lawfully in the building at the time. So it's very, very important that prevention floats to the top. And we talk about all the things that we're gonna talk about tonight as far as mental health, uh, the best way to manage a critical incident is preventing it from happening in the first place. So it's, it's a key point. So lots of different layers here to make this, these, all the schools in the district safe, and I'm sure we're going to go into a detail in many of them this evening. Great. Thank you, Mr. Lepaka. Our next question is for uh, Mr. Albanese from John Jay. What does my school do to prevent, school, prevent violence? Hello. <laughs> so there's a number of things that we do, and many of them are proactive, a proactive approach, knowing our building, understanding the culture, understanding the community, uh, partnering with our community partners, police, other organizations, uh, emergency uh, responders, and trying to predict what may happen next and learn from the tragedies of others and make sure that we are prepared all the time at the building level and working with district of course to get any support that we can from them. Uh, within the building uh, there's a number of measures in the building uh, staff that are uh, strategically placed throughout the building and uh, the police officer in the high schools school safety officers, and all these folks come together to make sure that we're doing everything we can to be as proactive as possible. And then to also drill so that we're ready for if or when something actually does happen, so we're ready for a real world situation. Thank you, Mr. Albanese. The next question is for any of our principals. Does your school have a team assigned specifically to student safety? Not sure if one of you wants to answer first. Ms. Fazio? 
we know our mic works really well. So yes, all of our schools have a safety team. And um, some of us have separate crisis teams, child study teams, um, threat assessment teams. Um, most of it just comes from our safety uh, team itself, but yes, we all have them. Great, and that addresses the next question was, is there a designated, uh, a team designated to school safety? Our next question again for the administrators, what can we as educators do to ensure that we were prepared for incidents which may occur? I'm not sure. Okay, Mr. Albanese. So at the beginning of every school year, uh, we have professional development with our educators and we go over what we call shell. Shell stands for shelter in place, hold in place, evacuation, lockdown and lockout. We go through every procedure and we even get specific to our building. Each building is, has different needs, uh, different benefits and drawbacks, and each principal will talk specifically about those drill procedures and how it pertains to the building, and even more local, down to the individual classroom. If you've been through any of the school buildings, and I'm sure you have, you see that each classroom presents different challenges, and we'll work with teachers to find the best way to make sure that their classroom is as safe as possible. But the best thing as an educator that they can do is know those procedures before they need them. Most every email that I'll, I'll send out to our staff about safety and procedures is know them before you need them. When you are in that moment, there will not be time to open up the folder with the emergency procedures in it and read it. You will have to know those beforehand. And don't only drill it when we have formal drills, do it with, your, with each individual class period, with each kid, with each class period, with each student, to talk about uh, what would we do if this happened in here? How would we react? And so yes, be ready for the formal drill. Uh, drill informally with each class and uh, just know them before you need them. When we talk about educators, we don't want to forget about our children's first teachers, all of you, parents and guardians. Uh, what you can do is know the procedures as they're written on the sheet that you saw when you came in, and it's also on the school web pages, uh, a parent guide to emergencies. It takes a lot of the questions, and it will answer them for you. So you'll know the difference between, say, a lockdown and a hold in place. There's very big differences between those particular and it'll uh, it'll set you at ease in many cases and if you have any further questions of course reach out to anybody at the building at district level and we can talk more specifically to that thank you mr albanese again to our principals in the event of a security emergency what are the drills the district is performing to protect our children Ms. Hernandez? Sure, I can jump in on that one. Um, we are required to have four lockdown drills a year. We do roughly one each marking period or each quarter. Um, we're also required to do evacuation drills. We probably know them as fire drills, but we do eight a year. We're required to do a certain amount before December. Um, and four of those have to be a blocked egress which means that we create scenarios where one of the exits that the children and staff would go out is purposefully blocked and we have to think on our feet and go out a different way. Um, so we drill, 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 and we practice, and that's what makes us prepared. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Uh, next, for any of the principals, why aren't drills conducted during lunch times? Mr. Thompson. Uh, drills are conducted at lunch times um, because it's important that in large group settings that the students know where they have to go. Um, also, making sure that they are able to perform both the lockdown and evacuation drill during the lunch time is very important. So we do conduct drills because there are different nuances to large uh, area places when students either have to evacuate or uh, hide. Great, thank you, Mr. Thompson. The next question is for either Dr. Shukat or Mr. Thompson. I would like to know how the children are prepared for drills in their new school environment when entering seventh grade. Dr. Shukat. Sure, thank you. Um, first of all, I think it's important to point out that um, uh, we, we try to be as consistent as possible across the district. Um, so a lockdown drill and 
Van Wyck is the same as the lockdown drill at Wappingers Junior High. We're a large, large school district, so it's important that we be consistent from school to school. Uh, so that's one of the ways, is that when students come into Van Wyck, they already know um, the basics for those drills. Um, in addition to that, we do, um, during our behavior code meetings in the, uh, in the fall when school begins, we make sure that we do the uh, safety drills and the protocols with the students during the uh, code of conduct meetings. And uh, we also just started doing um, separate uh, safety meetings with the students, uh, professional development for the kids. And we started doing that through the gym classes. Uh, yesterday we went through nine, nine safety drills, and then we're gonna do it again on, um, on Friday. So um, it's important that students understand um, all of the circumstances behind an emergency and how to respond to that emergency. For instance, um, we're trained to, the teachers are trained that when we go into a lockdown to sweep, uh, to sweep the halls and make sure they get everybody into their classroom that's in the hallway. But what if a student is not swept during that, um, during that sweep? Uh, students have to be able to think on their feet. They have to be able to know what to do in those kinds of critical situations and um, be able to find a place that they feel is safe for themselves. So we went over some of those scenarios as well. We did it in the gym, so we looked at the gym and said, well, what happens if we had a drill in the gym and you needed to find a safe hiding space? Where would you, where would you hide? And so the kids were very creative. I mean, the kids do know where those uh, hiding places are in the building. So um, they were very, you know, they were very good about that, participating in that part of it. Um, the other thing I think is important is that you have to understand in a real emergency, it's very possible that people become overwhelmed and very anxious, and the adults themselves um, may not be able to uh, fully participate in that emergency. And so students need to be able to step up to the plate and know what to do on their own in case that should occur. Uh, in most instances that won't occur, but there are instances where someone may become overwhelmed by the anxiety of the situation and a student needs to step up. So that's part of our training uh, to make sure we prepare students for every circumstance. It's not only preparing them for the drills uh, and th those areas that we know are gonna happen, but we also wanna prepare them for things that might not happen uh, and that could happen. And so we wanna prepare them for that as well. Thank you, Dr. Shukat. The next question is for either Mr. Kezalawa or Mr. Albanese. I don't think John Jay has done any drills with the students if there is an active shooter. Is this going to happen? Hello. We have done drills to date. We have done two lockdown drills. Matter of fact, our SRO, the police officer in our building, does coordinate with local law enforcement. We have sheriffs come in, we have state troopers come in, we have East Fishco come in, even Fishco police officers come in. Uh, as we clear the rooms, we actually have them knocking on the doors so that at the first entrance of each room, the students see that it's law enforcement so they can get used to it. If we ever have a true lockdown, that will be the first point of person that they do say. We'll continue to drill. We have lockdowns, lockouts, holding places. All these things will continue to happen. Thank you, Mr. Katsalawa. The next question is for Ms. Hernandez. What is the safety protocol for a student who is away from their classroom if there is an attack? Sure, I think Dr. Shukat just spent um, a nice amount of time talking about that at the junior high level. Certainly um, at the elementary level, we do, we have little ones all the way down to kindergarten, so we make sure that our students um, know what to do in the event that they are not in the classroom. I think it's important to note that we all drill during lunch, recess, uh, different times of the day. We hit the morning, the afternoon, we do even when school events are occurring, like at elementary, of PTA all the time, um, you know, book fairs, things like that. So we practice when, um, as much as we can during different times of the day to make sure that we are prepared for that. So yes, our students absolutely, even down to kindergarten, uh, know what they're supposed to do in the event of an attack. Um, and the purpose of drilling is to test our plan. So when we are conducting all of these drills, as a safety team, we meet and we talk about how the drill went. We ask um, feedback from law enforcement who participate, especially in our lockdown drills. 
and we take the time to go through where in the plan um, if there were any instances that we need to address as a safety team and then we talk about it and certainly making sure our kids are safe if they're not in the classroom when we call a drill is absolutely a paramount priority thank you the next question is for one of our school resource officers please explain the benefit of having students sit on the floor with their heads down rather than teaching them to fight back or find an escape route I think you can look at this and you know depending on what grade level you're looking at you know uh, at an elementary level um, sometimes the teacher obviously has to take control of that room uh, you know obviously you're looking to try to have those kids quiet and uh, keep some sort of control over them. so maybe at an elementary level that might be the case as you start getting up to the secondary levels and the kids become a little more uh, involved in what's going on uh, you know we do encourage them to stand up and you know the teachers that are in that room again they are you know they should be positioning themselves in a, in a place of defense uh, you know so if somebody is making entrance into that room it's not just lock the door and that's the end of it uh, you know they should be thinking about all right you know what's the next step if somebody makes entrance into you know interest into this room you know what am i going to do uh, you know do i need to defend myself should we be looking for in a, in another uh, way out of the room potentially so yes at the secondary level they shouldn't be sitting there you know with their heads down they should be actively participating in what's going on and, and thinking of the next step so thank you next is for any one of our principals what additional resources can the district put in place for special education, inclusion, integrated classes where there are students that may not be able to remain quiet and sit still during a lockdown? Okay, Ms. Spazio. Um, there's a variety of things, but we provide sometimes headphones. Um, in the beginning of the school year, we kind of give them more instruction and time to acclimate to the drills. Um, so during that time, we, we understand if it goes a little bit slower and that the staff can have the time to teach the student how to use different things such as the headphones, um, anything that's a quiet um, object to fidget with, um, computers that are quiet. So they have time to learn to practice that. And then as the drills progress through the year, we expect it to go much faster. So those things are in place in all of our classes and all of our buildings. Those are just a couple examples. Okay, Mr. Thompson, you'd like to add on? Um, I, I would say our best resource is the actual staff that work with the students, though. They are very aware of their accommodations and their needs, and they do an excellent job as they get the training and the PD that we're talking about with the other students. Thank you. I believe Mr. Albanese already touched on this, but if anyone like, would like to expand, how can parents be more involved in helping support school safety? Ms. Fazio? I think we talked at length, and I know um, our representative from El Terrace also said this, about planning for things that are not just happening at school. Um, I talked to, I still talk to students about it, and I did as a teacher about making plans when you're going to events, baseball games, malls, know where your exits are. Um, so I think parents need to have a plan at home too. A lot of kids don't have a fire evacuation plan at their house. Um, so they also need to have such plans if there was an intruder or when we go to the mall or when without being too over sensitive about it or making it a scary situation. I think parents in their own way have to decide on how they want to create plans for a variety of situations since most of these events don't happen at schools. Thank you. And I think, yes, go ahead, Mr. Albanese. Just to uh, also say, be as understanding as you can and I'm speaking to you as a parent and, and it's easier said than done but there's a real emergency especially a lockdown situation uh, it could be hours many many hours before you you get to see your children as we go through our procedures but um, it, it's I'm saying this to you and I know that I would have trouble being that understanding too and I know that my son is in that building and I just want to be with him. And I may not be able to because the professionals, the people who drill with them, the teachers and the administrators and the support staff of the building are going through that procedure in a methodical way. But um, do your best, I'll do the same. Thank you, Dr. Shukat, you would like to add? Yeah, I, it's um, also required, it's required by law to have a parent on the safety team. Um, and I think that's very important. Not all discussions when we meet as a safety team are appropriate for a parent to be there. Sometimes a parent can't be there, so we have to caucus 
without the parent being there. But for the most part, um, our parent is very engaged, and that's very important. They're the, they're the arm uh, to the community. Uh, they help us get information out to the community. Um, at one of our PTA meetings, they suggested that we do uh, some vape training uh, for our students, and so we reached out to Cape, and we're very fortunate to have Cape. Uh, they came in, and during our phys ed classes, they provided that, uh, that, that training. Uh, so the, the parents provide us with information that are helpful as far as what parents want, what parents need to know, um, and the other way, you know, and in reverse as well. So I think the parents are very, parents on those safety teams are critical. Thank you, Dr. Shukat. <clears throat> so uh, I'm Deputy Montana. I'm actually the SRO at Arlington High School. I'm formerly the SRO here at RCK. Uh, Deputy Seymour cannot be here tonight. So just one thing I want to add to that. Um, parents, a couple a couple things, and Mr. Albanese hit on it. Um, as a parent myself, like our first knee-jerk response is to want to get to the school as fast as we can and if there is a true emergency. And just from a law enforcement perspective, all the emergency vehicles that are trying to get there, um, we just ask that you kind of keep in mind that by doing so, you're impeding with our response time and you're also potentially putting yourself at, at, at risk, your own safety. Um, so we would ask that you, you, you know, keep those things in mind as you try to respond to that scene. Again, our, our, we're all thinking that we want to get to our kids as fast as we can, but it may not be helping the situation. The second thing with that is when we're getting information, whether it be from our kids or if something is being put out third party, we would ask that you would probably not want to spread it on social media until it can be validated or verified. Um, that is a big hindrance that we run into. And uh, just a couple things to keep in the back of your mind. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is uh, for Mr. Lapaka. Some of these um, have already been addressed, so I'm sure you will um, just review anything that has not been said, just because we do have so many questions to go through. But what can we do to better control for compliance to safety rules, lockdown drills, fire drills in the school setting, and part two, how do we get the parents to reinforce these rules with children at home? Sure, so two of the objectives of drills is number one is to develop muscle memory, which Mr. Albany's mentioned earlier about is there simply isn't time in an emergency to, to look in a book, to look at a flip chart, you need to have that muscle memory. So that's why the drills instill that muscle memory. We're, we're really good at doing fire drills. There hasn't been a knock on wood a fire death in a school since 1958, and that's primarily because of the fact of all the drills that we do and all the fire regulations that are in place right now. Lockdown drills are reasonably new in the last several years. Same type of things to develop that muscle memory. The other piece of it is that we, when we evaluate when we do these drills, we're evaluating these drills. So if we're not learning something every time we do a drill, we're not drilling correctly. So these drills are actually evaluated by certain people within the building, law enforcement personnel, and the objective there is to, to refine the practice. Are kids talking? Are kids visible? Are teachers grading papers when they're supposed to be in the safe zone of the room? So, and there is a compliance piece there to, to address it. So if someone is not doing what they're supposed to be doing, building administrators are, are there to, to make sure that they're communicating to them that this can't occur or we need to refine this moving forward. As far as in the home, obviously the message that you've been hearing already up here as far as what to do and what not to do is critically important. Um, having age-appropriate conversations with the students. The school is great about helping you with those conversations by reinforcing the fact that they need to listen to um, their, their teachers, their the administrators in the building, because again, they plan and train for these events. So it's important for them to listen to them and be compliant with the rules and regulations within the school. Thank you. The next question is for Mr. Lokima. How do I teach my kindergartners the importance of a lockdown drill without scaring them? Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Paca just touched on that a little bit as well. Um, we talked about this one as a team, and we believe that being honest with your child, but considering the age of, of the child is, is probably the most uh, best way to go. You want to explain that drills are for your safety. Uh, we talk about fire drills very easily. We, we drill just in case there's a fire. You want to be able to figure out how to get out of the building safely. Um, you can use the uh, the notion of stranger danger and you know talk about the idea of how uh, if there is a if there is a stranger in the building, then the then the build then the school will follow a certain set of procedures to ensure that everyone is safe. Um, and in addition to that, we did provide on your question handout uh, a link to a Scholastic article. 
that had some, that that answers that question across all grade levels from a, from an educator perspective. But I think the perspective that they shared, which is valuable at home, would be um, is to also maybe you could be honest and, and, and be as truthful as you feel you need to be for your child, uh, but talk about the procedures of it. Procedurally speaking, uh, you know, kindergarten students love to uh, follow direction and, uh, and to please, please the adults and help their friends in the room, uh, and it would be great if we reinforce that um, as, as well at home, to just like, like Mr. Opaka said, follow directions. Thank you. And I would just like to welcome uh, Kiernan Lawler, who is arriving. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Appreciate it. The next question is also for Darren Lokima. How are we training substitute teachers to be compliant with the district and school safety policies to ensure that they feel equipped to handle an emergency? Uh, that too is a great question. Um, so we. Um, we, 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 we rely on the buildings. Uh, each building is different, so some of, their, some of their procedures might be slightly different. Uh, the building layouts are different. Uh, so we rely on the building to provide uh, uh, procedures and, and maybe some handed out as a binder for when the substitute shows up for their assignment uh, in each school. Uh, and speaking with the Human Resources Department as well, we know that uh, we want to expand some training some, for maybe some pre-service activity to ensure that everyone has more of a global view uh, ahead of time before they start their service in the schools. Thank you, Mr. Lakima. Mm -hmm. Mr. Albanese? It, it, another thing that we do is we'll hand substitute teachers a what we call an intruder key. Every classroom has a, uh, a key are keyed on the inside as well and any district key can lock that door so once you're in any key that you have even if you work in Ketchum and you happen to be at John Jay that day for some reason you can secure that room and put that door in between you and that wall in between you and whatever danger is in the hallway so our substitutes each have one of those keys and that's something we learned from uh, the Sandy Hook tragedy where there were substitutes on duty who did not have that capability Thank you, Mr. Albanese. Next one is for any of our principals. How has safety in the Wappinger Central School District school classroom improved since you started coming up with new ideas? Mr. Katsalawa? It continues to develop on a yearly basis. I mean, with the more and more acts in society, we get smarter. Um, we've gone to the extent of positioning our bodies in the room. Where are we gonna locate our students in the room? Um, some of our teachers have even gone to the extent of placing certain file cabinets in designated areas. We have uh, markings on the floor to make sure that when uh, an intruder walks by, that students are in, aren't in the line of sight. So safety continued to develop on a, a daily basis. There are honest, real conversations that we have to have in order to keep our students and faculty safe. Thank you, Mr. Gazzalawa. The next question is for Mr. Lokima. What is the protocol in environmental and social disasters? Sure, so um, all of the school safety plans, which we uh, talked about briefly, do, do um, speak to multi-hazard situations, including environmental catastrophes. It's part of the template and requirement within each plan, each school does that. Uh, so if there was a, a weather event, uh, you know, you might refer to the back of your uh, uh, guide and you would use uh, something uh, like a shelter in place. So the shelter in place would be invoked if there was a high wind warning like we had the, uh, that wind event uh, in May of last year, the year before, I can't remember now. Um, and, uh, and, and so there's, there's, there's procedures and protocols in, in place for that. Uh, when we think of social disasters, uh, you know, things that might affect uh, the mental health of a community, um, you know, and if it, it involved the school setting, we would certainly um, uh, look to put in place, uh, you know, uh, ways for which a student seeking comfort can get that through our support staff and any outside resources we have to bring in. Thank you, Mr. Lakima. The next uh, question is for Mr. Lapaka. What gives you the slightest sense that the security initiatives that we have put in place could do anything to keep students and staff safe? So, so I, think I touched. so I think I touched upon this a little earlier um, when we opened that um, I wish that every single client that we work with had as many proactive measures and layers that the Wappinger School District had because in some cases there are just 
districts out there that are simply checking the box to say that we have to do this and we do it because we have to do it as opposed to really buying in and buying is a huge piece when it comes to safety and security you have to believe that these things are necessary to keep our students and our staff safe so there are countless measures within the Wappinger School District that are in place. Some of them are very visible that you see on a daily basis, whether that be security personnel, visitor management, uh, you know, uh, drills and other types of things that you'll see that are visible and many other things that are not visible. And some of these things are contained within the building level emergency plans that are confidential documents. They are confidential by law uh, because of the fact that they do contain sensitive information that is not for public dissemination. But there are countless other things that are out there as well. One of the major things is that technology, which is a, a big piece in schools as far as, and, and there, there are catalysts when something happens that people think, we need metal detectors, we need cameras, we need all these things. Technology does not respond to emergencies. People do. And that's why it's critically important that everyone, whether you are a cafeteria worker, a custodian, a teacher, has the level of training to be able to prevent whenever possible and to respond effectively in an emergency. And this is something that is perpetual. It's never ending. Uh, it's ongoing all the time. Um, they do it internally. Our team works with, with building teams at each individual school building. So it's ongoing. So there are many, many things that are in place right now, both from prevention to response, that the district has in place to keep everyone safe. Thank you. The next question is for our school resource officers. What forms of identification are acceptable for visitors to be granted access to the school? Yeah, preferably a government issued ID would be the best, um, you know, but on top of the ID, there should be, you know, checks and balances to make sure of, you know, why the person is there. Um, and it's really just more of about, you know, a matter of verifying the reasons, you know, whether it's a meeting or, or something else, just, uh, you know, just ver you know, verification of, of the reasoning uh, in conjunction with the ID. So. Thank you. Any of our principals could answer the next question. It's a continuation on this. How accessible are our schools? Can anyone walk in at any time? Dr. Shukat? Uh, first of all, um, the Board of Education policy stipulates that um, visitors to the school must have a legitimate business for being there. So in order to ensure that that happens, we maintain a Google Calendar that the greeter has as well. So every teacher, um, every every parent meeting, uh, every CSE meeting, 504 meeting, where visitors are coming to the building, uh, the teacher puts that into Google Calendar. And therefore, the greeter, uh, when that parent or person comes to the uh, uh, comes to the front door. Uh, we know that they have legitimate business or don't have legitimate business. It doesn't mean that if they're not in the calendar, they don't get access, but the greeter knows to get an administrator to make sure that we vet that person before letting them into the building. Thank you, Dr. Shukat. The next question is for Mr. Lokima. Why aren't the ID scanners properly installed and functioning at Wappertures <laughs> Junior High School? Okay, so there was a little bit of a delay in terms of the uh, technology that we thought we were originally going to use. Uh, and then, uh, so we corrected that just around the uh, holiday break. Uh, and so we have been rolling them out. So we have four schools rolled out uh, as of today. Uh, John Jay, Royce C. Ketchum, Fishke Elementary, Brinkerhoff. Uh, and I'm happy to report that, you know, before too long, the, all the rest of the remaining schools, including Wapnish Junior High School, will have a functioning uh, visitor management system in, in, the, in the vestibule. Thank you. The next question is for any of our principals. How do you handle an intruder that has entered into the school? How are our kids protected? And what safety measures are put into place? Dr. Shukat? Um, first of all, we want to make sure that an intruder doesn't get into the building. That's the first thing. We have a single point of entry in the building. Uh, I'm sure every single school in the district has a single point of entry. Um, and the district put a lot of time uh, and resources into making sure that there was a vestibule where people can walk into the first layer of the vestibule, but they're not necessarily in the building. And so we're checking to make sure that, uh, that you know, we, we check their license, we uh, check their identification, we make sure that uh, everything, everything is okay on that end. Um, however, if there is an adult that is in the building, let's say a substitute uh, teacher who legitimately can be there, but the teacher, that substitute teacher doesn't have, is not wearing the badge, um, students and staff know 
to, uh, the students know to go to an adult. They know that if somebody is not in the building, is in the building that shouldn't be there, to make sure that they uh, inform an adult immediately. And then, um, and then from there, we, we check that out. So on occasion, it doesn't happen, but on occasions, we'll have a substitute that's not wearing their badge and they're a stranger in the building, and that protocol is put in place. Thank you, Dr. Shukan. The next question is for Mr. Lokima. What are we doing to ensure that the buildings are secure before and after school is in session? So uh, this isn't this isn't there's no perfect answer for this because our and we're talking about it with the with the police uh, and our, our partners and and law enforcement uh, earlier. Um, you know our schools aren't built to be fortresses. Uh, if we wanted TSA quality screening, we would have to put in a number of measures in place uh, to ensure that the buildings are locked and fully staffed with security, uh, screening everyone that comes to the door 24 hours a day, uh, and that's just not. That's just not where we are in the community. Um, they are they are community schools. Uh, we believe that we're making the right steps uh, in, for the morning for procedures, for example, now that we have the vestibules in place, uh, to be able to uh, make sure that all the doors are locked in the morning. Um, we're, we're, we're doing that uh, starting at, at all the elementary schools we just talked about at our last principals meeting, uh, and we're following up as well with the secondary schools to where uh, if students need to be there for a before school program, they can wait in the vestibule and assign staff will be there to let people in the building. Uh, and just to keep it a little bit tighter, make sure that all the doors are locked uh, and you know all the way through uh, the arrival time. Uh, after school is tough. I mean, some schools are easier than others, but you know we have uh, practices letting out, you have rehearsals letting out, you have games and activities coming in, you have clubs that use the building, uh, and, and limited staff to direct traffic uh, for those who are visiting. Uh, we're always talking about scenarios for this, we're going to continue to talk about scenarios for this, uh, and try and come up with a, a way that, uh, that allows for uh, you know, improved safety uh, as quickly and as, as we possibly can. Thank you. The next question is for any of our principals. How do you prevent a suspended child from entering the school when other students are entering the building together? Mr. Thompson. I would, uh, <clears throat> once again, I would say the primary uh, issue is to make sure that the parent is informed uh, properly about the suspension before that even comes to fruition. Um, also, making sure that staff identify those students and that information is communicated to staff clearly so they are able to know which student should not be allowed in the school setting. If students do come onto the school grounds, they are also informed that they could be possibly trespassing at that point in time. So pending on the infraction and what they're suspended for, it, it's mainly important that you have staff that are present and that are no, in notification of that suspension. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Albanese? And the staff will include transportation as well. So they should know that the student is not authorized to even board the bus. Uh, at that point. Great, thank you. The next question is for Mr. Lokima and or our principals. It is concerning that anyone could walk into the outdoor play space at Chief Road while the children are at recess or a child could walk or run off site, especially the kindergarten playground, which is right next to the parking lot. Also at Fishco Plains Elementary. This is especially a worry of a parent of a child with special needs who posed a flight risk. Can the outdoor play areas be fenced and gated so that the outdoor outsiders cannot enter the space and to ensure the safety of the children at play? Okay, so uh, this question is, is timely. Thanks to Alteris and our first year of service with them, they did a district-wide walkthrough and risk assessment, or I suppose they would call it an opportunity for improvement type of an assessment uh, for the district. And uh, fencing was one of the topics that came up. And we had a nice uh, lengthy conversation when we were going over their initial draft uh, assessment of our district. It just happened on the 24th of January, uh, where we talked about, um, you know, the benefits, the pros and cons of fencing. So uh, I think I think one of the striking points that was made in the conversation is that uh, fencing is great for keeping honest people out, uh, but for those intending to do harm, uh, fencing does very little good. Uh, so this question does act from this question does a ask also from the perspective of a student uh, who is looking to uh, flee. Um, that thankfully doesn't happen very often, but for those students uh, who we already know in advance who might uh, need additional supervision on the playground, we do provide that. 
um, you know, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis and sometimes it's dictated by a student's individual education plan. Um, with that in mind, though, uh, there are certain situations across our campuses where offense in certain areas does make sense. Uh, for, for, for areas where there's possibly an egress from a local village community into the campus, offense of some sort might make sense. Um, and, and, uh, and, and those are conversations we are going to have uh, as we uh, go through this uh, draft improvement plan uh, and talk about ways to, to, to get that in place. Obviously funding is, is one thing and, and again efficacy and pros and cons of using fencing in general. Thank you. The next question we can start with Ms. Rizzi and then maybe continue with Dr. Shukat if you would like to expand. How will the district continue to support students, mental health, and the students who struggle with mental health issues? So I believe it was Mr. Thompson who said earlier that our faculty and staff in the buildings are our first line of defense, and that is absolutely true because they are the ones that have direct contact with your children on a daily basis. And then of course, every single building is staffed with a variety of pupil personnel service providers from school counselors to school psychologists to school social workers. If staff members do have concerns about children's mental health, a change in status, or something like that, they make referrals to the PPS staff immediately as well as notifying administration. Um, at that point in time, the appropriate staff member would meet with the child to determine what's going on, whether or not there is contact at home, which we always call, and then also to determine whether a possible outside referral might need to be made. Great, thank you. Dr. Uh, Shika? The only thing I could, could add at, that, at this point, and I think that um, Mrs. Rizzi did a, a very good job of um, uh, giving an overview of the process. Uh, one thing that I can add is that the PPS committee uh, generally meets once a week and we discuss kids. If we uh, have to meet more often because of an emergency, we meet more, we meet, we'll meet at that point depending on the emergency. But we meet on a regular basis and uh, we have an excellent uh, psychologist and social workers and school counselors in the district and they, uh, they understand the mental health needs of students, they know how to identify uh, children are having difficulties and if, if it's not something that they can resolve themselves in the building uh, then they will make that uh, they will help the parents and also make that outside referral themselves. Thank you Dr. Shukat. The next question is for Mrs. Rizzi. You're speaking about protecting children from outside forces so they can feel safe in school. My question is what are you doing about the inside forces, the bullies that make children feel unsafe every day? So research does show that a positive climate in a school building is the number one preventative action for preventing bullying. And I'm very proud to work in the Wappinger Central School District and also was a parent within the district that the district took the initiative many years ago to implement positive behavioral intervention supports district-wide in every single one of our schools. So that is certainly the first step because we all know that prevention is the best way. Um, we also provide a safe and supportive environment for staff and students, as well as, of course, being DASA compliant and following all New York State regulations as far as making sure that our students are safe. Thank you. The next question is for Mr. Lokima or Mr. Lapaka. What steps are being taken to protect students from the random acts of violence, particularly shooters that seem to be more common in the recent years, and what is being done to identify and address these individuals before an incident of violence occurs? Thank you. So I, I think uh, in addition, you know, to recapping a little bit of what uh, Mrs. Rizzi said, talking about uh, the, you know, the, the proactive things we can do with character education, uh, but really uh, it, it's certainly very important, but there, there also is a new concept, and John will speak to it a little bit because I know he's recently had some training, uh, about something called a, called a uh, threat assessment team. It's been a little bit of a buzz around a lot of schools uh, and, and, and education communities talking about ways in which we are possibly identifying individuals who are, um, you know, behaving in a way that might 
you know, be something we want to keep track of. Uh, and, and, you know, it's kind of a new concept, uh, but it is something that, uh, that, that the education community is taking an active role in trying to provide professional development on and have community think tanks on just to get a sense as to, you know, how do we do this without really, um, you know, like, you know, tracking students, uh, you know, but really identifying and hopefully being proactive on it. So maybe, John, you want to add to that? Sure. So um, I had the opportunity recently back in November to attend the National Threat Assessment Conference in Virginia, which was attended by over a thousand educators and law enforcement personnel from over 35 states. Trooper Wilson actually attended as well. And the <clears throat> overarching um, theme was the, the use of threat assessment teams in schools, which are recommended at both the local level, the state level, and at the federal level as well. Schools right now, not to suggest that schools don't do a form of threat assessment now, but really what the, what the goal is, is to, to utilize a nationally recognized and evidence-based model. So something that is proven to work effectively to, to, to look at threats that might come to our attention and how to resolve those threats to either be transient threats or ones that might be more serious, to develop a safety plan going forward and to monitor those conditions. Um, we know that for, even from a recent uh, Secret Service study that was done back in November as well, is they looked at some of the major events that happened, uh, you know, uh, school shooting events. And the theme there again was that in many cases these were preventable there were warning signs that were exhibited. There is no profile for these active shooter situations, but there are things that occur, things that manifest, and, and one of the big ones was that someone knew something about the shooter's intentions, but either failed to recognize them or simply did not feel comfortable going forward. So it's gonna be a, you know, it's gonna take a real tribe to, to make these effective, <clears throat> and specifically, it starts in the home, where the, the communication there has got to be that, look, you know, if you see something, you need to say something about it. And they have to understand there's a difference between helping someone and so-called tattling on someone or ratting on someone. Because again, you may very well be saving someone's life or many people's lives in that case. So it's important to have that message consistent, to bring that information forward, and to have these threat assessment teams, which we're going to be working with the district and implementing them uh, uniformly across every school to utilize both the internal mental health people, administrators, as well as law enforcement for a multidisciplinary team to, to look at those threats and be able to identify and come up with mitigation plans moving forward. Thank you. The next question is for any of our principals. Do our students know whom to report suspicious activity to? Mr. Kanzalawa? I can speak at the high school level. Yes, they do. You know, that's a tribute to see something, say something. I can speak on behalf of all the houses. We receive emails. They pull us aside. Um, pictures, text messages. Our students want to feel safe. You know, they're the first ones to come forward. They are eyes and our ears. They report to the teachers. The teachers have a strong rapport with them. So yes, at the high school, they do. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Fazio? Um, at the elementary level, um, seeing something and say something can only happen when it, at the elementary level, we do a lot of teaching of the difference between tattling and reporting. It's a daily struggle because peer pressure is like a powerful force. So we are constantly talking about the difference between that, the importance of reporting, what we report. Um, it's a mindset shift too in a culture at home that's advocated at home as well about things we need to report. And I know that my teachers, my staff, and I always make ourselves very visible. They're very observant to see if a kid is a little off that day. Um, when I have new students come, we introduce who's helpful people that you can talk to and feel safe around, including myself. But one of the biggest struggles is having kids report because once they start hitting that fourth, fifth, sixth grade level, it becomes harder and harder for them. So I'm glad to hear that it continues to be enforced through all of our schools, but it is something that at home it would help Again, really encouraging your child to report things because the peer pressure makes it very hard sometimes for them to do that. And we do have, did you already say about our website, where um, parents can also and students can also um, report anything suspicious on that as well. Dr. Shukat, you wanted to continue? Yeah, I just want to add um, that we, I think it gets back to the single point of entry in the school, the single point of entry. But once the students are in the building, all the doors lock and the only way for anybody to get into the building is from the main entrance way to the school. Uh, students know, and this is part of our training, that if they see anyone, anyone trying to get into, a, into the school from a door other than from the front, they know to report that activity immediately to an adult or an administrator. And that's very important. Even if it's 
me trying to get in into the into the school from the gym doors they know not to let me in so that's very important because we want to make sure that we maintain that single point of entry and if we open up another door we're not always ensured that that door is going to close properly on the other end so having that single point of entry in the in the morning you know throughout the building is very important thank you dr shuka the next question is for mr lokima with district elementary schools with a population of 500 or more, what is the district doing to ensure that they are staffed with a proportionate number of administrators to students so they can respond to all emergencies and to ensure daily operations are carried out efficiently? Okay, and I'm gonna take that second question, that one after that as well, uh, sort oh, yes. of double it up. Okay. Um, the, you know, so we, we are a large district. We have 10 elementary buildings. Uh, two of our elementary is the largest, do have assistant principals full-time staffed. Um, we do recognize uh, this. Uh, you know, sometimes we're reminded by our administrators that uh, perhaps a little bit more support is, uh, it would be uh, kindly accepted. Um, but we, we in, in, in a lot, in large part, it's a, it could be, a, it's a budgetary issue. We did have the conversation last year during the budget cycle to bring in a couple of floating administrators to try and uh, share uh, the, the balance across some, some of our middle-sized elementary schools, uh, but it was just something we weren't able to support at that time. But it's a conversation we'll continue. And that includes the assistant principals. Correct. The next question? You're good? Yes, that, that okay. is it. Good. The next question is actually for Assemblyman Lawler. Uh, has the district considered employing retired police officers or SROs for security the same way other districts do at every school. Great, and this, I'm gonna introduce it okay. and then I'm gonna turn the mic over to Assemblyman Lawler. Um, so the, every question labeled with 31, so basically talking about why don't we have an SRO in every school? Why aren't security guards walking through the buildings at any time? Is it possible that armed police officers to be at our schools daily? I mean, there was a, there was a common, there was a common question brought up in many different ways and, and I just wanna just direct everyone's attention to this. Uh, advocacy flyer. So this was created uh, with the help of uh, cer certainly uh, Assemblyman Lawler's office. Well, I see his assistant over there, Kira Gorman, and I had uh, num numerous phone calls. We had numerous meetings with uh, with Kieran, which is wonderful uh, to have his support as our uh, local uh, uh, legislator, um, as well as uh, Senator Serino's office providing feedback as well. So what we tried to do initially was draft a bill that basically said. Um, that uh, we are going to, we would like to exempt school safety personnel from the New York State tax cap. The, the tax cap kind of holds our hands a little bit on how much revenue we can uh, generate in order to add uh, uh, you know, all sorts of program services and staff to our district. So um, imagine if we had to put security officers and guards in every building, we have multiple buildings, the only schools that really have school safety officers and or school resource officers are our high schools. So if we have to add it for 12 more schools, uh, we're millions of dollars, right? So it's well over millions of dollars in contractual services or salary and benefits. Um, and we believe we believe strongly in providing additional security resources to our schools, but we are uh, limited by the amount of funds and revenues that we can generate. So, uh, with that, and that's and that's fine. So we understand the need to to be conservative and uh, and to and to keep our costs as low as possible. Uh, but with that being said, we did uh, work very well together in drafting a, an assembly bill, um, and then through further conversations with uh, with with his peers in the Senate and Assembly. Um, uh, uh, you know, I've learned of Assembly Bill S, uh, the Senate Bill, uh, it's called S3008, and uh, the Assembly Bill A1836. These bills are in process now. These bills state exactly that. So if they make it far enough in the legislative process, which Karen's going to talk about how that works, um, then, then the governor has a chance to vote on it, and if voted upon, it becomes law. So uh, it'd be wonderful to be able to have access to be able to do that type of an exemption. And I will uh, pass the microphone over to Kieran so he can explain how it all works. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Darren. Thanks to the school district for uh, having this hearing and being on top of school security. I'm proud to represent the district, but I'm also a parent in the district. My uh, my boys are at Brinkerhoff and my girls are at Van Wyke. So, uh, for a number of reasons, I'm very happy to participate in this in this forum. the The challenge with this legislation is. The tax cap is popular among, um, I would say, a majority of lawmakers. I would say it's popular around the state. Um, and there is a fear that if you make an exception to the tax cap, the exception eventually will 
devour the tax cap because there'll be the except, exception for security this year and the exception for something else next year and so on. And next thing you know, there's so many exceptions, you don't have a tax cap anymore. So that is, uh, when I've talked about this bill with my colleagues, that is a conversation that they have. They say, once you break the ice and have an exception, there's going to be uh, more exceptions and then the tax cap is over. And the tax cap is something that was bipartisan. The current governor signed it several years ago. Um, so I don't want to say that it's sacred, but it is something that, that people respect. Um, so in advocating and in winning hearts and minds of, of lawmakers, I think the key is to say this is a narrowly ta tailored exemption. It is the paramount responsibility of uh, us as legislators and a school system to protect our children, it's very logical to make this one exemption uh, for the tax cap. And I, and I in, in conversations, I see my colleagues say, okay, you know, that makes sense. This isn't something frivolous. This is the most important thing. Keep our kids safe while they're at school. Um, especially, you know, given the, the news of, and the, and the um, violent things that we've seen over the last few years in schools and elsewhere. So that's part of the challenge. I think you can, um, in your advocacy, kind of, kind of explain that. The other challenge is the center of gravity in the New York State Legislature right now is New York City. New York City isn't concerned about the tax cap. They have, uh, they do have property tax, but they also have an income tax. Tax cap isn't something that New York City lawmakers are all that concerned about. So in talking to New York City lawmakers and the Speaker of the Assembly, the top person in the Assembly is from New York City, the top person in the, in the uh, Senate, uh, she's from Yonkers and she also represents some of the Bronx and most of her membership that put her in that position, and the same with the Speaker in the Assembly, come from the five boroughs. So we really have to um, educate them on the tax cap itself and then the um, reason why we need this exemption. So that is, you know, very important uh, because if you, if you don't get the support of the New York City legislators or get their attention on this, it's not going to go anywhere because uh, whether people on Long Island or in the Hudson Valley or upstate like it, right now the, the legislature is, is very much uh, uh, controlled by, by New York City. It's not even so much Republican Democrat, it's kind of New York City and then not New York City. So that is, that is a challenge. Everybody wants school safety. Um, we are fortunate that we have uh, what are called majority sponsors. In other words, uh, the, the sponsor in the Assembly and the sponsor in the Senate, they're in the majority party, which right now is the Democrat Party. Absolutely critical. So that is a key first step to have um, the person, the legislator carrying the bill, be um, in the party that is in power. That doesn't mean that both parties aren't going to sign on to it uh, and become co-sponsors, but definitely uh, a big advantage and actually a prerequisite. Um, whether officially or unofficially, to have a majority member. Um, the normal legislative process, this would come through the Education Committee. Again, the Chairwoman of the Education Committee is from Queens, Kathy Nolan. Um, that's someone in addition to me, Senator Serino, uh, Dee Dee Barrett is the Assembly member for the Town of Poughkeepsie, parts of the school district. Um, you definitely want to get the Education Committee chairs in both houses. Um, get in their ear and advocate to them. However, that's kind of the official way things work. Bill goes to the committee, gets out of committee, it gets voted on the floor. But big things get done in the New York State Legislature at the end of March when the budget has to be done, and at the end of June when the legislative session has to be done. So this is the kind of bill that may never get out of the Education Committee. It might go through the Ways and Means Committee at budget time, at the end of March, um, when you hear about the three men in the room, or now three people in the room, it might be something that is negotiated in at the last minute and come to the Ways and Means Committee. So uh, for that reason, I think we should be uh, definitely talking to members of the Ways and Means Committee uh, and the chairs of the Ways and Means Committee. And Ways and Means is just a old fashioned way of saying the budget committees um, when we're trying to win hearts and minds. It takes 76 votes to pass legislation in, in, the, in the assembly. Uh, so it's always good to try to get co-sponsors and get 76 co-sponsors. It doesn't guarantee you anything, but it's a helpful talking point to be able to say, hey, I have 76 out of the 150 members of this body 
support this legislation so much so that they become co-sponsors. Let's move this thing forward. This thing has popular support. Let's get this done. And I'm working on doing that, um, uh, you know, at my level, kind of peer to peer with my colleagues. But it definitely helps to have their phones ringing and their and their emails uh, lighting up. And the best thing is face to face communication with your lawmaker. You know, it's relatively easy for someone to ignore a phone call or an email, uh, but a, an appointment and face-to-face -face communication definitely gets your priority to the top of the uh, of the heap. And it's much harder to ignore you. And you know, if you're if you're a lawmaker, you're talking to parents, and parents are saying, "Hey, I want my kids to be safe in their schools." Uh, the biggest expense for New York State is education. That's the biggest thing in our budget. Uh, let's make sure that we're providing a good education in a safe environment, and this particular legislation will um, help achieve that goal. So uh, this this flyer, uh, you know, gives a sample sample language as to uh, if you were to reach out to one of the Senate or Assembly members uh, who are identified in the back of this list, and I'll certainly work with Karen uh, Karen's office to make sure that that's the best list. But we have members of the committee chair, the committee chair for both the Assembly and the Senate. Hopefully, I got the ch the chair contact information correct. Uh, and so by just starting to contact them and say, hey, we need to move this along, I'll get some contact information from the Ways and uh, Ways and Means Committee, as Karen has suggested, and then um, we'll do is just share this flyer out with our entire community uh, so I think uh, I think if, if you can't do face-to-face -face, uh, you know let's 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 talk to them uh, via phone let's send emails uh, if you believe that, that this is a, a way uh, something that you feel is important as we do uh, to advocate to allow us to create that um, uh, to great to create these opportunities within our budget so thank you thank you the next question is either for the, one of the principals or Mr. Lokima. What is the school's protocol for alerting families when there has been a serious incident, and what is the timeline for that? So we we do if there's a serious incident we do, and I think this was touched upon earlier um, by uh, Alonzo, uh, our deputy, uh, Dutch County uh, uh, Sheriff's Department, um, where you know. There, there's, you're going to hear a lot if there's something serious happening. You're going to, you know, as much as we try, uh, you know, we, the, the protocol with communications internally is to try and keep it minimum so that way emergency responders can communicate with us. Uh, we want to make sure that parents are getting the most accurate information possible. Um, so when we know something and it's factual or, you know, or we, we know we have enough information to give out that's not going to cause any kind of widespread chaos, we're going to release that as quickly as we can. Uh, we're going to work with law enforcement and, and recommendations from them as well in terms of uh, protocols of, of, of sending students and, and you know uh, to particular locations if necessary, and or then directing uh, parents to those locations for uh, or indoor guardians for a reunification process. So um, you know it's something that we hope we never have to do, um, but we're prepared to communicate uh, everything as much as, as possible that we can give in a timely manner, and, and just ask that uh, that everyone is patient. Because uh, we are not forgetting about the community for which you guys, uh, you know, are uh, the parents and guardians of our most precious assets. Uh, so we want to keep you informed uh, and ask that you know we we try to ignore social media and any things that are out there because it's probably not the full uh, accounting of events uh, and information uh, that can be provided. So um, if anyone wants to add to that, basically you know we will keep you informed and it'll be act, you know factual information and with actionable items that we would need you to. Uh, to help us with. Thank you. The next two questions are for Mr. Lokima. They are connected and you just touched a little bit on both of them. Does each school have an evacuation location in the community where students can be moved if need be? And what are the current plans in place for parents to collect their children in case of violent events? All right, so, so similar, I'll refer to the back of that parent guide. Again, it's a reunification process. This is one of those things that is uh, part of our school safety protocol. Um, it is, uh, so I won't get into much detail, but just know that, um, you know, for example, uh, if we, we all know where our evacuation locations are going to be. We prefer not to share that ahead of time because we don't want to create a traffic jam uh, getting to the site where you might anticipate your child to be. We will let you know when, when you know, where to go and when to go uh, and, and because we need to get there first to get things set up so that way we can go through the process of reunifying you uh, with your child um, and, and that can 
uh, seem uh, extra chaotic if everyone's trying to swarm onto the scene at the same time. Uh, and we really need to create a process in place to ensure that those who are picking up are who they need, who they are on the emergency list uh, to be able to take a child so that way we can fully account for everyone uh, in, a, in a given situation. And I think, um, so there are current plans and I think both questions can be addressed with that is that, you know, we'll be in constant communication, um, you know, and, and release information as necessary. Thank you. The next question is for any of our principals. Are our administrative teams trained in crisis management? Mr. Thompson? Yeah, uh, yes, we are. <clears throat> we uh, train in crisis management. We also do tabletops. We also have had training in uh, de-escalation techniques in terms of, you know, when we deal with students who are in crisis as well. Um, I think anybody else could add in, in addition to that. Uh, we've had several trainings in professional developments over uh, the many of the numerous years that I've been in the district. Mr. Albanese? Uh, many administrators have also taken advantage of uh, FEMA courses, uh, ICS 100 and ICS 100 for schools. ICS stands for Incident Command System. Some people say structure. It gives, uh, well, it gives structure to an emergency. It, it, it has specific roles for specific people. Uh, it, it will help you figure out where your command post should be, who your incident commander should be, uh, who your liaisons are, who's your communications officer, so on and so forth. Uh, these are free courses. I would even encourage many of the parents out there, just check it out, it's free. So you get an idea of what we're going through and what we're following, what protocols uh, in case of an emergency. Ms. Fernandez? Um, I think it's also important to note that we all have crisis teams in our buildings. Um, even with us as small as we are, we have a team, our school psychologist, social worker, um, and staff, and we certainly meet and talk about children and make sure that um, we are prepared in the event of any crisis. Also, um, Michelle Costabile, who I see down there tonight, is one of our Handle with Care trainers in the district, along with several others. And I know many of us administrators, um, since the question is particularly about administration, are trained in Handle with Care or certified in it, um, which means that we know in the event that we absolutely need to put our hands on children, we know how to properly do that so that they are safe from themselves or others. Thank you. The next, oh, go ahead, Ms. Rizzi. One small thing to add is that in addition to the building level crisis teams, we also have a district level crisis team that is activated if there is any sort of an incident or tragedy in a building so that additional mental health staff can be brought in to assist in another building if it's necessary. Thank you. The next few questions are for our school resource officers. What safety standards are being followed during the bus drop off in the morning? With the amount of kids, especially at the high school level, it seems probable that anyone can enter with the masses of kids entering the building undetected. The parking area and drop off areas aren't monitored, so anyone can enter the grounds during this time. I've only seen traffic monitors directing traffic at John Jay during this drop off and pick up time. We'll start with that one. Uh, you know, what you have going on at the high school levels, you know, th there is a lot going on. You have uh, parents dropping off, parents picking up, uh, buses coming in and out. You have student drivers, student walkers. Uh, you know, we do the best with the, uh, the manpower that we have. We spread out our safety officers as well as our administration, uh, you, know, you, know, all, you know, across the front of the buildings and, and around the area. Uh, you know, we, we try to our best to know the students, you know, have our ear to the ground to kind of get the vibe of what's going on, know what's out of place, what looks a little different than the norm, uh, you know, and when we caught our, you know, run, run with that the best of our ability, basically. And I, um, continuing on, in the afternoon at dismissal, again, there are so many students coming from the building and going on buses and others being picked up. It seems unsafe when the parking lot is not being monitored. Why isn't there a staggered dismissal implemented so that the entire school population isn't in the parking lot at the same time? Although there is a gate station at John Jay, I have never been stopped and have been able to drive right through, right up to the front door. Why is that and what is the purpose of the gate? Uh, afternoon dismissal, again, it's um, you know, the same type of situation you're gonna have in the, uh, in the morning. Uh, again, we do the best we can with the, with the manpower we have uh, spread around the area. I agree. Somebody should be stopping that person at the gate. Is what you know. There are certain point, uh, toward times of the day uh, at the end that it may not be manned uh, if they are directing traffic. Uh, but again, we do the best we can, and we're always looking for you know ways and measures to 
proven practices that we have. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are the precautions that are being taken to check to see if a student brings a gun, a knife, et cetera, into the school if there are no metal detectors? Absolutely. So uh, part of the equation here is training the staff uh, to be aware of student behaviors and suspicious activity. Um, we're also training staff to, to look for you know, potential bulges that may be in clothing that wouldn't normally be there. Um, if things are reported to staff, whether it be through the anonymous tip lines or direct, um, you know, then that will, will escalate to another level where, where either a school search or law enforcement will be called in for safety measures. Um, I think a big key to this equation is the relationship that all staff in the schools develop with their kids uh, to be able to have that level of comfort where if they hear something or they saw something on a social media site that we may not be privy to, um, that they're coming in and reporting that to the staff. Uh, ultimately, they, they are our eyes and our ears when, when we don't have access to these, to these social media avenues. Um, you know, kids are leading three lives. They're leading their life at home, their life at school, and their life on social media. And we don't always get that entire piece. So it's very important to have that relationship on that level with staff and students to where they feel comfortable to come and disclose that with us on a regular basis. Thank and I think that does happen quite frequently with all the schools that I've been able to be in. Thank you. I don't know if anyone would like to expand. Um, you, you, recent, you just spoke to this, but have metal detectors been considered? Okay, Trooper Wilson. I can tell you that we've definitely had that conversation in the school and amongst law enforcement without the school. And when you talk about metal detectors, there are a lot of moving parts, the pros and cons. Pros, obviously, it could act as a deterrent from someone bringing a weapon into the school, gun, or a knife. The negatives with technology, unfortunately, comes cost. Then you have to consider having it manned up front. You have to have extra staff. And if you're not in the high school where you have an SRO that has a weapon, you have a civilian that is possibly standing there waving the people through, and potentially if they come up with a positive that the metal detector goes off, you have somebody unarmed standing there. And at that point, what do they do? Are they searching that person? And you have to take those things into consideration that you don't have somebody armed at the front door. And necessarily all the SROs in the building may not be available at that time. Also with that is the arrival. You have to have, provide extra time. If you have thousands of kids coming into the building, at the time you're going to have to extend the arrival. We, Eric and I have discussed this and what do we say about 45 minutes to an hour if you're bringing everybody in to the building. You guys have great things. Great. Thank you. Why isn't every close proximity of criminal events cause for a school lockdown? That's I think that's the dependent on what the event is and it's all situational and what do you consider you know, close proximity to the building. The information pamphlet that you guys were given explains the difference between a lockdown and a lockout. The lockout is used, obviously, if there's suspicious activity, it could be law enforcement activity. Sometimes the schools will put the, initiate the lockout for themselves. They see something suspicious or someone suspicious out and they'll contact law enforcement and go into the lockout procedure. So I think it's all situational as to what the situation is on the outside and actually what you consider close proximity to the school if the school would decide to go into a lockdown. Anything? Great, thank you. Continue, Mr. Albanese. So explain a little more about a lockout. Essentially every school is always in lockout uh, with that single point of entry and all doors locked. So if we did get word that there was a, a reason to be a little bit more on edge or a little bit more sensitive to what's happening outside of the building, we would then move people to strategic locations to be on the lookout. But essentially, every school, every day is in lockout. Thank you. Continuing with law enforcement, explain how the front desk and the new vestibule will stop someone with a semi-automatic weapon. Sorry. Um, so with regard to the vestibule, um, <clears throat> this may not necessarily be a full-on deterrent, but it's meant to slow down the entry into the building. 
uh, ultimately we want to allow extra time for the report to be made for emergency services to respond if there's an SRO in your building they can respond appropriately um, you know nothing is foolproof you you can't prevent bullets going through glass and then shattering glass and somebody coming through but it's an extra step for them to get into the building thus allowing uh, more time and getting a, a response quicker from whatever staff are, are necessary at that point. Thank you. Continuing with law enforcement, what is the local police response posture of an active shooter event inside a school? So having experience with that this uh, past year, um, I can tell you the role of the SRO is gonna be responding to whatever the threat may be in the building. Um, we're trained to look and listen and uh, we're gonna respond to whatever, whatever we're hearing. Um, when a lockdown is activated, whatever steps your school takes to, uh, to initiate that, when we are responding, when law enforcement is responding in the building, all should be quiet. So the noise that we're, we're hopefully, or I should say unhopefully hearing, is that of whatever the threat may be, and uh, that's what we're gonna respond to. Um, regarding the, the officers and other uh, law enforcement, first responders, EMS, you know, you're going to have this influx of personnel responding to the school. Uh, law enforcement will be gaining entry, and then if there's an SRO there, they'll be trying to pair up with the SRO and uh, secure the building. Um, so again, going back to earlier, why it was so important where we asked that parents just, you know, that, that response to, to get to the school as fast as you can, just consider that you have this influx of first responders. Um, you know, you may be talking... 100, 150 police coming. You have fire personnel that are gonna have to stage in the area. You're gonna have EMS on scene staging in the area. Uh, roads could be shut down. So um, you, you are just gonna have a full-fledged response in a, in a true emergency. And uh, everybody is coming. Everybody will be there. Mr. Lokima spoke on this earlier. It is a lengthy process. Nothing about this when it comes to ensuring you know, staff safety, student safety, the safety of the community, you, you have to take into consideration that it is going to take an extensive amount of time for us to be able to do what we need to do. It's not a speedy response in, in that you'll see on a TV show things might be wrapped up in an hour. Well, that's theatrics. In real life, it doesn't play out like that. And, you know, we ask that you keep that in mind. Trooper Wilson? I just want to add to Alonzo's answer. We as law enforcement also, we participate in active shooter training. Every year sometimes agencies will do active training, active shooter training together. And thank you to Wapter School District because you graciously let us use your buildings. So we actually perform these activities in a school building and it gives everybody a chance to familiarize themselves with the buildings. We also do walkthroughs of the buildings. Eric called me today, when I called him today, he said I actually have one of your troopers here with me now. So in addition to SROs being in the building, we as state police do walkthroughs. Whoever is on patrol that day, go to the school and become familiar with all the common areas, the faculty and staff, and let the kids you know, see them in that a different setting, especially the high school students and the elementary school kids always love us. <laughs> it's when you get to high school. Not so much anymore. <laughs> you have anything? Good. Nothing. Thank you. Continuing with law enforcement, how do you know for certain that a student rumor is not credible? What deems it not credible? Trooper Wilson? Since I told me to keep the mic. Uh, that is through an investigation, a police investigation. If we get any kind of rumblings that somebody might have a weapon or potentially bring a weapon to school or might, there might be, you know, coming to school to do some kind of harm, Law enforcement gets involved and we go through the process. Sometimes we have to go to the extent of checking their social media. We have a computer crimes unit that can look through everything. If we needed to get phones, we would take them into evidence and conduct an investigation. And you have to understand, like Alonzo said, it's not, it is not like TV where it's wrapped up in 42 minutes. You have to go through a lot of paperwork in order to get that. We go to the child's house if need be, see if they possibly have access to any weapons in the residence. We can run checks to see if they have pistol permits and if they have any guns that are registered to them. And it's just a thorough 
investigation, if we think you know, through interviewing that child, if mental health, it, you know, that child needs some kind of medical intervention, we could take them up to the hospital and have an evaluation done before they come back to school. So just feeding off of that, you know, the, the, the panel before had spoke on the threat assessment teams and that's something that you'll see come into play uh, moreover. But again, just because, as, as Trooper Wilson said, just, be, just because a threat may, may be deemed not credible doesn't mean that there isn't action taken. Um, you know, a big thing that we hear in these settings is something may be said and, oh, well, I was just joking. Well, unfortunately, in this day and age, we're not at the ability to, to make that determination at points. And as Trooper Wilson indicated, there may be things such as mental health screen uh, recommendations that are made. Um, so, you know, whether or not there is credibility to it, that doesn't mean that it's not a cry for help and there aren't steps being taken to correct that. Thank you. A continuation along this, this uh, topic with Mr. Lokima for the next question. Traditionally, how long would a student be suspended for making an empty threat that they were planning on shooting up the school and this empty threat was reported to the school di district by someone using the anonymous tip line who wasn't sure it was an empty threat? Okay, so it, it's really, it, you know, the, we're, we're always on a heightened state of alert and awareness and sensitivity when it, when it comes to this. But if someone reports to us that there is a threat of someone bringing in a gun to shoot up the school, um, we, don't, we don't know when that comes. When that comes into us, we have to take every one of them seriously. Uh, we have to act on them as if it's possibly the real thing. Uh, and that causes, uh, you know, and then, and then not knowing, sometimes you have more information, sometimes you have less, sometimes you get names of kids, sometimes you don't. Um, and uh, it really just becomes situationally dependent. So if we're talking about having to actually have identified someone who made a threat only later to find out that it wasn't, um, you know, uh, credible, uh, you know, you had already gone through uh, a number of different exercises and, you know, and, and the amount of community awareness sometimes uh, that the, the that rumors from these threats could create has a, has a detrimental impact on the school day itself. Um, you know, students feel stress, staff feel stress, you're fielding questions from families, You some students don't come to school. Um, if it goes on and on, it really can um, exasperate a situation which ended up just being uh, you know, a misunderstanding or perhaps uh, just a, a false alarm or someone playing a prank. Um, you know, and we just, we can't take any of those uh, situations lightly. Uh, so, you know, we go by our code of conduct, uh, I guess is how I best answer that. We go, uh, you know, we handle every situation differently uh, based on the, the, the evidence in the case before us. Um, I'm also going to take the, the, the question right after that because it, it mentions the tip line. Uh, so in terms of spreading word through the community at the schools, anonymous tip line is not anonymous after all. Um, it's an online system, so I think uh, a lot of us hear about the fact how we, you know, we as individuals who uh, work, you know, work in a social media world uh, leave a digital footprint. So um, while you might not be entering your uh, name uh, or address information, we encourage you to when you're submitting a tip that's uh, that, that's that's actually uh, you know preferably uh, not empty, but in fact uh, you know a tip of something that we need to be alerted to uh, that you provide us with contact information. Um, but if if it's, if there's a threat that comes in and it is anonymous and it is serious, um, you know there's a digital footprint out uh, with online resources, and uh, we we interact with law enforcement, and sometimes uh, if the threat is deemed of a certain um, you know, uh, a type, then, uh, then, there's, then they have abilities to, to communicate with the service providers and say, hey, we have an immediate threat against possible, uh, you know, loss of life or harm of injury, uh, and, you know, can you help us? And it's up to them to really say, you know, yes, we understand that that's, that's very important and we need to help you. Um, or they might say you need a, a subpoena from the court, which takes time. Um, but the reality is, is we're going to take every single threat seriously and we're going to, uh, to do the best we can to identify, uh, you know, uh, and, 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 you know, hopefully what would be, uh, you know, uh, uh, an empty threat, uh, to use the words, uh, and, and, and basically put all everyone's minds at ease. So 
Uh, we, we do value the anonymous tip line system. It is anonymous, uh, and, but in certain situations, we can try to go to extra lengths to try and identify at least uh, where that tip was submitted from. Thank you. The next question for law enforcement, continuing on this topic. When threats are made to our school, example, recent threat of a student bringing a gun to school, why can't the staff be made aware of that prior to the general public receiving an email about it? We wouldn't need to know the name of the student or person issuing the threat, but we certainly could be more vigilant and mentally prepared should something happen. In conjunction, why aren't our greeters at the lobby desk made aware of threats as they are truly the first line of defense in the building should someone try to get in? If there is a situation that requires, requires law enforcement intervention, there are a lot of layers to an investigation. And a lot of the times we don't want to give out too much information because it can impede our investigation. There may be a lot of people that we want to interview and we don't want to tip anybody off to what our next steps are. Obviously, if we have information that there is an imminent threat to anyone's safety, at that point we will make the proper notifications to people in the school and obviously the public. Yeah, and I think going back to the earlier question on how do we know for certain that a rumor is not credible, um, you, you're going back to assessing what the situation is and you want to verify it. Again, as Trooper Wilson said, if it's imminent, then that's a different story. But if, if law enforcement is still trying to piece together whether or not it's credible, we don't necessarily want to create uh, unwarranted panic amongst staff, faculty, and, and students when it's, when it's not necessary at that point. Great. Thank you. The next question is for Mr. Lapaka. Can special door locks or stoppers be installed in the classrooms? Uh, so the, the quick answer is no. Um, nothing that the code requires that a door be able to be opened from the interior of the room in one single handed motion. So there cannot be any third party devices installed on it. The door must be able to, to close and latch so the use of magnets, et cetera, are not permissible. <clears throat> one thing that the education department did do last year is they issued a directive to school districts that allow them in emergency situations to be able to pass a board of ed policy that allows them uh, schools to barricade doors in emergency situations. So whatever means possible to barricade that door in an emergency situation is permissible as long as the school district does pass a policy and there were some other provisions there as well. But generally doors, uh, aftermarket devices like deadbolts and, and other devices that are being marketed on the, on, on the market right now are, are not permissible. Thank you, Mr. Albanese. Earlier I mentioned the intruder locks on the inside of each classroom so you're aware uh, you're able to get out. You can lock it from inside, but you're always able to get out. So if the threat does enter the room, you don't need a key to exit the, the, the classroom or office that you're in in order to get out. You can get out quickly. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the next question is for uh, either Mr. Lokima or Mr. Lapaka. I think this was discussed at the beginning, but can you please explain the district's relationship with Altara's consulting group? Yeah, I'll, I'll just start by briefly saying, you know, with all the requirements mandated by the state, um, you know, we recognize the need to uh, bring in someone who can, you know, provide full-time support uh, to, uh, to give us risk assessments and training uh, and, and talk about any kind of uh, other uh, security measures we need to have evaluated and report back to us. So um, Dutchess County BOCES uh, 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 had created a service a couple of years ago um, where they did uh, consulting work and were able to get that service through BOCES, which is actually was a cost savings. Uh, so they advertised the service to us. Uh, as well as our local districts. A couple other districts started before us in the area uh, and hearing positive reviews from uh, the services that, that they received from Alteris, uh, we decided to contract with them this year. Um, you got a sense from some of the answers already given, some of the services that they provide for us and we're very happy so far, have a great relationship, but maybe Mr. Lopaka, if you want to expand it all about what your typical contract includes, that's Sure, very quickly. Uh, essentially, the first step in the process is assessment to identify the improvement opportunities we discussed earlier, working with the district to prioritize uh, the improvement opportunities. Really, what we don't want to happen is to walk into a school district, identify improvement opportunities, and then to leave, and that becomes a punch list on someone's desk. 
Uh, the real challenge is that schools simply don't have the time, and in some cases, the amount of expertise to be able to, we like to say, to move the ball down, down the field. So we work with them to prioritize the improvement opportunities, to project manage and implement those opportunities, uh, to work with them as far as training at uh, each individual school level. So we work with both the district team as well as each of the individual building level emergency response teams and providing training, tabletop exercises. We're going to be working with the district in the implementation of threat assessment teams. And it's a 24-7, 365 uh, consulting arrangement. So it is not unusual for myself to be speaking with Darren on a Saturday or uh, if there's an event that's going on there, we collaborate with our law enforcement partners as well. And again, because of our work around the region and, and other districts as well, we do have you know good contacts and, and um, you know good arrangements and relationships with other districts as well. So it's a it's a real great partnership moving forward, and we're delighted to be here. Thank you. The next question is for Mr. Katsalawa. How can you explain the, to parents that when they come to evening events to pick up their child, it is a serious danger to pull up close to the building and wait several minutes? In the event there is a need for police, fire, or ambulance, they are blocking the entryway. At the high school, it becomes more and more difficult with the size of the events that we hold, especially during football games, basketball games, soccer games. Uh, we hold regional events there as well. This weekend coming up, we have Science Olympiad. One thing that we always do do, though, is staff it to the max that we can. We have East Michigan Police on, sometimes two to four present at all these events. We also have our SSOs on. We have additional chaperones on. We do the best that we can. We're constantly in communication with the district office for additional signage. And most importantly, it's speaking with the people that are in a stalling position and telling them why that we need them to move. You know, one part about it that we believe in is educating everyone at all times. So it's just making people more aware of why they can't be in that location as well. And we trust you guys, you know, coming on campus and reading the miles per hour and the safety zones, there's a reason why those things are there. We take every precaution possible and we ask that you follow them. Thank you. Mr. Albanese? Especially on the high school uh, campus, we can never forget that there are young, inexperienced drivers there. Uh, they're learning. And um, sometimes they're the ones making the mistakes. And uh, there's other times where the adults are the ones making the mistakes around them. And, and, uh, you know, as Mr. K said, uh, signage is number one, and that's the first line of defense, but we, we in some cases, will also send communication out uh, to uh, parents or visitors ahead of time, letting them know that the event is happening, there will be traffic, and please abide by those rules that are posted. Uh, but uh, there's a, a certain amount of people that routinely disregard it, but if we do explain, like Mr. K said, people like to know why. Okay, if we have the time, I would love to explain that. Sometimes we don't. So we just ask for everyone's cooperation uh, when it comes to traffic on campus. Thank you. So the next question is for Mr. Lokima. Why does the district not ensure that there is adequate cell phone service from AT&T, Verizon, et cetera, at the schools? For example, there is absolutely no service at Oak Grove Elementary School, Van Wyck, or Royce Ketchum. In the event of an emergency where the school is on lockdown, teachers and students are completely unable to communicate with the outside world. The communication could include details for emergency responders about an attacker such as the location, number of assailants, injuries in a room, etc. In this modern day, it should be a requirement that schools have a backup means of communication that is separate from the school's infrastructure in the event of someone being unable to monitor it. Two-way radios are not a solution for this. The ability for, to communicate from within a closet via text messaging or allowing emergency services to monitor a room situation via speakerphone should be paramount. Yep, uh, we, we recognize that as well as a need. Um, we, we, it also came up on our opportunity to improve uh, assessment survey from uh, Alteris. Um, I recently tried to reach out to, to Verizon uh, to no avail as of yet uh, to find they have, a, they have a lot of 800 numbers, so it's different ones and they redirect you. And then you wait on hold and then get redirected. Um, so I didn't, but we do have a municipality meeting uh, where we meet with our um, town supervisors on a quarterly basis. Our next one happens to be next week on the 11th. Uh, so we're gonna, all of our six municipalities that we, uh, six, you know, 
I think it's six municipalities that uh, that uh, our district encompasses. And part of the conversation will be to see if they have any ideas about how we can maybe get antennas added. We, we certainly have enough land in certain locations uh, to add an antenna, so we certainly will be willing to have a conversation about ideas about and cellular antenna systems. So hopefully positive news to come of that very soon. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Albanese. Just briefly, you know, uh, it mentioned in the question about being able to communicate with students during an emergency. Know that there's only so much that a cell tower can take. And during an emergency, like a lockdown, and back to what I was saying earlier, you want to get to your kid. You want to talk to them. You want to get proof of life and that they are okay. But in doing that through a cell phone, you may be blocking emergency communications with police officers and fire department EMTs who are trying to communicate with their own people using the same cell tower. So again, do the best you can. Thank you. So the next three questions are for Mr. Lokima. They all are similar in dealing with upgrades to our fiscal security of our school buildings and or safety improvements. Great, thanks. So I'll, I'll, I'll close out the night um, with, uh, again, Recapping on the fact that we had our uh, opportunity, uh, our, our improvement opportunity survey done with Alteris. We had a lot of really good conversations, some short term items that we can try to address. Uh, we're definitely going to do a building walkthrough and reassess cameras. Uh, areas like stairwells will certainly come up. Uh, audio improvements where the PA system uh, speakers aren't working so well. And cellular antenna systems, discussions on fencing, window glazing, window stops uniform signage, exterior lighting upgrades, which we're actually pleased is already in the works. Um, and, you know, so there's a, there's a myriad of different things that we're gonna be talking about, hopefully be able to come uh, to fruition on a whole bunch of them. Uh, and then I'll also end with, uh, you know, the last question over the next two years, what type of safety improvements can we expect? If we get that legislative change, uh, not to say we're putting all our eggs in that basket, but you know that could open the floodgates for some wonderful new improvements uh, 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 in the more near term versus the long term. So, um, you know, we, we continue. We'll continue to you know hopefully ask this, the community for support and that advocacy uh, as well. Um, so that being the last question tonight, I do want to say that we'll be. I'll be sticking around for a little while. Uh, if you guys want to follow up or have any comments or suggestions or feedback, we'd be happy to, to, to listen to that. Um, again, please email uh, myself with any follow-up uh, questions you might have. I, I can't thank enough the time that these folks up here volunteered uh, to, to help with this evening's presentation. Uh, it is being recorded. It will be available on our website uh, tomorrow or the next day. As I'll put all the material up there as well. We'll start hitting uh, you know, uh, uh, messages home about how to get to some of the information and, and hopefully continue this conversation uh, with everybody because it takes everyone's ideas and inputs uh, to really make things uh, work well around here. So thanks to everyone on the panel. Thank you all and have a wonderful night.